Hello, I'm Ann Petrick, Vice President of Research for Vistage. I'm happy to host the latest webinar in our Peak Performer webinar series. This series is designed to support your leadership climb by bringing the most trusted experts to the Vistage community. Experts who provide exceptional insight and best practices to help you navigate new challenges and opportunities. With the accelerated rate of disruption we've experienced over the last two years and extreme volatility of the economy, that adds to the challenge of leading a business. So it's more important than ever for leaders to focus on mindset. Today, we've invited Vistage Lifetime Achievement Award winner, Dr. Eve Masita, to talk about growth mindset and making the most during of daunting challenges of leading and living life easier. After more than a decade, of working with Vistage leaders around the world to share insights and practices related to the concept of growth mindset. Vistage Lifetime Achievement Award winner, Dr. Eve Masita has expanded her focus to encompass some of the most important skills necessary for succeeding in work and in life. We are privileged to hear her insights today. Eve, we're excited for you to enlighten us again on how to make hard things easier. Over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, thanks, everybody. So delighted to be here with all of you today. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I'm excited to share a preview of the newest content that I'm going to be launching with Vistage Group starting next year as a follow-up to my original mindset sessions, which many of us have had a chance to work on over the years. And with every new session that I create, I always have the same goal, and that is to craft content that will help you do two things succeed more and suffer less, both in your professional life as a leader and in your personal life as well. And that is absolutely the focus of our conversation here today. So what we're gonna tackle here today is the root cause of an enormous amount of stress and pain in both our personal and professional lives. And that is actually difficult conversations. And our focus is gonna be on two things to increase our understanding of why conversations so often become difficult in the first place, and also to develop an enhanced set of skills and tools to make these hard things easier. The core of what I'll share with you is informed by the truly terrific book, Difficult Conversations, by several members of the Harvard Negotiation Project. It's backed by decades of rigorous research and also decades of field testing with organizations all over the world. It's taken me almost 10 years to find something that I'm as excited to share with you as the original mindset work, and this is it. Okay, so as always, I'm going to start uh, our conversation here today by putting you to work. So I want you to think about a difficult conversation that you yourself had with somebody recently. It can be something in your professional life. It can be something in your personal life. Either one is totally fine. It's totally up to you. And this is something that you're gonna work on throughout the entire conversation today. So I encourage you to choose something that's significant. Um, I might even you encourage you to think about, okay, what's the one really hard conversation you've had recently that you totally don't wanna work on? You're like, nope, any conversation except that one. I encourage you to choose that one. I think you'll be glad that you did. For the record, I'm not going to be asking you to share that with anybody. Um, we'll do a little bit of sharing later, but it's not going to be about what the content of that conversation was. So no one will know but you. Okay, so take a minute, think about that, and write down who the conversation was with and what it was about. No need to, you know, go into like blow by blow level of detail here. Just a couple of nice, concise sentences is all you need for this first question. So I'll pause for a minute and let you go ahead and write that down somewhere. Okay, so now that you've identified the difficult conversation, I want you to think about this and write down an answer. And feel free to write down uh, or answer this question in whatever may, way makes the most sense to you. You can rate it on a scale from zero to 10. 
You can rate it on a scale from zero to 100 if you want. Totally fine to use a numeric, numeric scale, but make sure you write down a few things in words as well. So a sentence or two that describes how stressful the conversation was and in what ways. I'll pause for just a minute here and let you go ahead and write that down as well. Okay, so now that you've got that, the second question is this, how successful was the conversation? And again, you get to decide how you want to define successful here. Feel free to use a zero to 10 scale, your zero to 100 scale if you want, again, totally fine. And as before, make sure you also write down a sentence or two that explains why you gave it that number if you did give it a number. Now that I've got you thinking about a specific difficult conversation in your own life, I want to share some insights into why conversations so often become difficult in the first place. What does the research tell us about the root causes of difficult conversations? So generally speaking, there are five primary places where things go off the rails. One thing to note for our conversation today, I want to be really specific about this, and that is our focus is on the 99% of difficult conversations that you're likely to have in your professional and personal life, which is with people who are not actually struggling with a serious mental disorder of some kind. You know, they're just your normal everyday people who make you crazy in the same way that you make them crazy. So if you're dealing with somebody who's genuinely mentally ill in some way, that is beyond the scope of our conversation today. So let's take a look at where we typical, typically get into trouble with conversations. Once we have a solid understanding of why things so often go badly, we'll turn our attention later in the session to ensure that things consistently go better. So we're gonna take a look at five common conversation derailers, emotions, assumptions, different stories, persuasion, and blame. And as we investigate each one, I encourage you to think about how that factor might've played a role in the difficult conversation that you chose to work on just a minute ago, because I'll be asking you about that at the end of this section. Okay, so let's start with emotions on the next slide here. The unfortunate reality is that most of us have never learned how to deal terribly well with certain emotions. They either weren't allowed to be expressed in the families that we grew up in, or sometimes they were disastrously or even dangerously overexpressed. Most of us haven't had very good role models for how to deal with emotions such as fear, anger, shame, vulnerability, and sadness. And so when these emotions show up for us or for others, we tend to fall into one of two strategies, neither of which serves us very well. So some of us may try to hide certain emotions from the person that we're in conversation with. In fact, we may even try to hide them from ourselves and deny that we even feel them. If you've seen the musical, The Book of Mormon, this is the put it in a box and crush it strategy. I'm not feeling any unpleasant feelings at all. And even if I were feeling unpleasant feelings, I wouldn't feel comfortable sharing with them, them with you because it would be too awkward or too weird or too scary. So no, I'm good. Everything's good. We're all good. By contrast, some of us may go to the other extreme, meaning we can overexpress our feelings to include the unpleasant ones, such as anger, bitterness and defensiveness. We don't shut down or shut out our feelings. We let the other person have it. You are going to feel the full force of my emotions, so you better buckle up that seatbelt of yours. As humans, we tend to think we are rational thinking creatures who are sometimes bothered by pesky emotions. But the research seems to suggest that actually we are emotional creatures who sometimes think rationally and who often use our rational brains to try to justify our emotions. Emotions are a core part of who we are as a species, so we need to get a handle on how to better deal with emotions in ourselves and in others. More on this in a bit. So here's the deal. When you and I are in a conversation, I know what my intentions are, and I generally believe that my intentions are good and pure. 
The problem is I also think I know what your intentions are. And if anything you are doing is pissing me off, I tend to assume that your intentions are bad. But unless you and I have already had a detailed, honest conversation about your intentions, I'm just guessing. And it appears to be human nature for us to assume negative intent if something the other person is doing is having a negative impact on us. So if I feel hurt by something you're doing, it must be because you intended to hurt me or make me angry or upset or whatever the emotion is that I'm feeling. I infer the intent from the impact that your behaviors have on me. In my mindset session, when we talk about feedback, I encourage people to assume positive intent on when they're on the receiving end of feedback. At the very least, we want to at least be aware of our very human tendency to assume nefarious intent when something somebody else is doing is making us feel something that we don't want to feel. One of the most critical things for us to understand about difficult conversation is this. Difficult conversations are almost never about what happened. They are almost about, almost always about what is important. So we don't disagree about which car was more expensive. We disagree about whether or not the more expensive car offered enough benefits to justify the higher price. We don't disagree whether or not our top salesperson is a jerk. We disagree about whether they bring in enough money for us to justify looking the other way regarding their behavior. So when you're in a difficult conversation, it almost always feels like what you're arguing about is what is true. But once we realize that what we're actually arguing about is what is important, that opens up an entirely different things, set of things for us to talk about. And what is important to one person may or may not be as important to the other person. And that's a result of the fact that the only person who knows why you care so much about X, Y, and Z is you. And the same is true for the other person. No one else has your unique set of life experiences that have brought you to this point. And the other person, well, they have their own likely very different set of life experiences, which lead them to care just as passionately about the things that they care about. So for example, let's say that you grew up in a messy household where dishes got left in the sink for days before putting, being put in the dishwasher. As an adult, dishes in the sink may make you crazy as does your significant other, who is the main dish abandoning culprit. But what if your significant other has walked a different path to get here? What if they grew up in a household with an incredibly demanding and angry parent who raged at them anytime something wasn't perfect? Maybe now that they're an adult, they like to be a little bit more relaxed about things because they can be, and they feel super controlled and defensive if anyone tries to boss them around like their parent did when they were little. So remember that difficult conversations are rarely about what happened or what is true. They are almost always instead about what is important, about what matters. A very closely related de uh, derailer is persuasion. Because we believe we're arguing about what actually happened or what is true, we think our job in the difficult conversation is to prove we're right, to demonstrate to the other person beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are right and they are wrong. Now, of course, they're doing the exact same thing. So the focus for each of us is on talking and not at all on listening. There is only one version of the truth. I'm in possession of that. And my job is to convince you of that or die trying. As a result, neither of us is curious about the other person's perspective. We don't want to learn. We want to win. Again, much of why we find ourselves here is because we misunderstand what the difficult conversation is about. Once we understand that each person can consider different things important, it opens up a much broader set of, conversa uh, set of conversation strategies and ways forward. So we live in a world of cause and effect. When something goes wrong, we understand that something or someone must have done something to screw things up. And because there are generally real practical and social consequences of being the person who is responsible for the screw up, most of us are des desperate to prove that it was not us. And in many ways, this relates back to the assumptions issue we talked about earlier. We know what we intended. And because we generally believe our intentions are good, we're less likely to see the role we played in a problem. 
but we sure as heck can see the role the other person played in the problem, in part because we don't actually know what they intended. And again, when in doubt, we tend to assume that if the outcome was bad, it's because their intention was also bad. One of the things that arises for many of us is an identity issue. Many of us pride ourselves on being smart, talented, capable, and in possession of excellent judgment. If it turns out that we were wrong and or if we did something wrong, that can feel like a very painful threat to our identity. And most of us are very, very quick to protect our identities. The things we feel are at the core of who we are and how we see ourselves and how we wanna be seen by others as well. So if I take the blame for something, that implies that maybe I'm not as smart, talented, or capable as I think I am, at least not 100% of the time, and very few of us are willing to go there voluntarily. So there are basically three things at play here. One is that I generally know what my own intentions are, and I assume that they're good, and I assume, therefore, that a bad outcome must be a result of something the other person did. Second, at just a very CYA level, I recognize that there are probably negative consequences of being at fault for the problem, so I am desperate to find somebody else to take the fall. And third, if part of my identity is being a smart person who makes good decisions, taking the blame for my part in a problem can feel extremely threatening. Okay, so these are some of the most common and pernicious reasons why conversations become difficult. What I want to do here is ask you to take a few minutes now to think about the difficult conversation that you chose earlier and identify which of these five derailers, so emotions, assumptions, different stories, persuasion, and blame, were most at play in that difficult conversation that you chose. Then for each derailer that you recognize as having played a role in your difficult conversation, just write down a couple of sentences about how that derailer showed up. So what was going on now that you can see a little bit more clearly? I'm gonna ask you to really take your time with this. And for the record, don't be surprised if you can recognize most of the derailers in that conversation. That is totally normal. And it's a sign that you've now got a lot more clarity into what was actually happening in that conversation which is awesome. So again, I'll pause talking for a minute. Um, take a minute, think about which of these uh, derailers showed up in that conversation that you chose to work on, and then just write a couple of sentences about how those things actually showed up. So if you're still writing, totally cool. That's great. It means you're going deep. No time pressure. Go ahead and keep writing there. Um, but what we're going to do now is take a look at what all of you identified as the root causes of challenges in your specific uh, specific difficult conversations. Um, so Joy, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to open the poll for us here. Everyone should see that pop up here. Okay. So this is a multiple choice question. You can select as many answers as apply. And what I want you guys to do is mark um, which of the five conversation derailers you identified in the difficult conversation that you're working on. And let's just see what the distribution is. So go ahead and vote. Again, you can vote for as many of these as appeared in your difficult conversation. And in a minute, we'll close down the poll and I'll ask Joy to share those results with us. So again, go ahead and make your votes, submit those, and we'll pause this in a minute. Joy, I'll give you a heads up in a minute when I'll ask you to close that poll.
All right, so Joe, I'm going to just go ahead and ask you to close that, um, display the results. Just so curious to see what we're going to see here. Okay, interesting. Okay, I mean, fairly even distribution across everything in the grand scheme of things. A lot of votes for emotions and assumptions there. Um, let's see here. Different stories, persuasion and blame. Okay. So fascinating. So I'm a research psychologist by training. So multiple things are going through my head now. One is when I do this um, in subsequent ones, I want to reorder the items. Sometimes like people just vote for the first things that are there. So like, ah, are we voting for emotions and assumptions because they're the first on the list or because they're the most powerful ones? But I mean, really in the grand scheme of things, we got a pretty good distribution here. Um, so I think on, on some level, a lot of evidence for the fact that, yeah, these are things that are very common and show up for many of us. So thanks so much, Joy. You can go ahead and pull that poll um, set of results down. That's great. Okay. Um, so thank you all for doing that. I appreciate that. So interesting. All right. Oh, let's see. We don't want to advance here. There we go. Oh, let's see here. Now it doesn't want to advance. There we go. So this is the pivot point of our conversation here the, today, the point where we go from developing a better understanding of why conversations become difficult in the first place, the five common derailers we just talked about, to where we start to talk about how to ensure that conversations go better. So in the full Vistage sessions that I'll be doing with groups, you know, we've got three hours to do all of this. So there are four things that I'll talk about there, emotional integrity, mutual understanding, the contribution system, and reframing. But for today, since we don't have three hours, we've got a little bit less time than that. There are just two things that I'm going to focus on, emotional integrity and reframing. And a little sidebar thing here, issue, all of these have their own challenges. Probably the, the most emotionally difficult one is the contribution system. So you guys are getting off the hook a little bit easy today. We're not doing the, the most emotionally difficult one. We'll save that for the full Vistage sessions that we do um, starting next year. But two critical things we're going to focus on here today, emotional integrity and reframing. So when thinking about how to describe the constellation of emotion-related behaviors we're going to be talking about in this section, I considered a lot of potential terms for it. Um, in the end, I decided to call them emotional integrity, and there are three main parts, share, acknowledge, and evo uh, avoid evaluation. So if we want conversations to be less difficult, even when we're talking about challenging things, we have to get a handle on emotions, both ours and those of the other person. Uh, difficult conversations do not involve feelings. They are at their very core about feelings. We need to recognize this and learn how to do a few key things better. So first and foremost, we have to be aware of the emotions we're actually feeling. I get that this sounds totally obvious, and most of us think we do this pretty well, but the research suggests otherwise. Time and again, when researchers ask people to identify the full list of emotions that they experience, people list a grand total of three. These are often referred to as mad, sad, and glad. So let that think in, uh, let that sink in for a second there. For most of us, the entirety of the human experience falls into three buckets. I'm either angry, sad, or happy. That's it. The problem here is that as humans, we actually experience a massively larger number of emotions, but if we don't have the language to describe those emotions, our ability to recognize them and handle them appropriately in ourselves and others is severely diminished. So Brene Brown's most recent book, Atlas of the Heart, is essentially a catalog of the 87 emotions and experiences that characterize what it means to be human. The emotions and experiences that are most critical to our successful functioning as leaders, as partners, as parents, and just as humans. So the first order of business for many of us is vastly expanding our awareness of what emotions we and other people experience. So if it's not already on your must read list, Atlas of the Heart, is one of the two books that I most recommend you immediately get after the session, along with the original Difficult Conversations book itself. So our first priority is to expand our awareness and language around emotions. And we also need to learn how to share those emotions appropriately with the person we're in conversation with. For some of us, that means we're going to have to be braver about admitting the emotions we're feeling 
to include the uncomfortable ones. For others of us, that means learning how to dial down the intensity of these emotions so that we're not blasting the other person out of their chair. So acknowledge, which is the second piece of emotional integrity, means communicating to the other person that one, you've heard the emotions they've shared with you, two, you care about their emotions, and three, you're working to understand why they feel the way they feel. Now, note that acknowledgement does not require you to feel those same emotions yourself, nor does it require you to believe that the other person's emotions are justified. It simply says, I hear you, I care about why you feel, and I'm trying to understand why you feel this way. And then the final part of emotional integrity is avoid evaluation, particularly in a conversation that is about something deeply emotional. This one can be particularly challenging. So avoid evaluation means reserving judgment about whether or not the other person's feelings are justified or not. So if the other person says, I feel upset, and you respond by saying, oh, you're totally overreacting, that immediately shuts down any productive conversation. The other person is now even more upset and likely to respond by getting defensive and trying to prove why they're justified in feeling the way that they do. Everybody loses. So in the initial part of a conversation where each person's job is simply to share their emotions honestly and appropriately, there is no role for judgment. At the very least, if you're feeling super judgy about the other person's emotions, keep it to yourself. So that's emotional integrity. And I put it at the very beginning of this section because it's generally the first thing that, do, that we need to do, but it's often the thing that we put off until the very end, the very last thing. So often, particularly in business settings where we naively believe that emotions have no role to play, we defer talking about emotions until they're so out of control that they burst through on their own, often in inappropriate ways. So instead, we want to front load the conversation about emotions so that we know what's at stake for each of us at the very beginning, and we can talk about it in productive ways. So opening a conversation by saying something like, I'm feeling really frustrated about this situation, and I'd like to know how you're feeling, and see if we can talk about it. Or I'm feeling really upset about how yesterday went, and I'm wondering how you're feeling about it, and where we go from here. So it gets your emotions on the table, it communicates to the other person that they get to share their emotions too, and it invites them to work together with you to get this all sorted out. So what I'd like you to do on this slide is to think about where your own biggest challenges with emotional integrity lie. So a few things you can try differently the next time you find yourself in a difficult conversation. So do you need to share your emotions differently? So like actually screw up the courage to share them at all, or maybe try to keep them a little bit more under control. Uh, do you wanna make sure you acknowledge the other person's emotions rather than just focusing on sharing your own? Do you, you recognize that maybe you need to resist the urge to judge the other person's emotions right out of the gate? Or maybe it's just deciding to front load the emotions part of the conversation rather than putting it off until the very end. So why don't you take maybe a minute or so here and write down one or two specific strategies that you want to experiment with in your next difficult conversation. And the more specific you can be here, the more helpful it's likely to be. So feel free to think about specific wording that might be useful when the time comes. Again, I'll pause here for a second, let you think about that and go ahead and write a couple of things down for yourself. Okay, so this brings us to the final technique we're going to talk about today in terms of how to make hard things easier, how to make difficult conversations less difficult, and that is reframing. Uh, my partner Dave 
is convinced that this is my superpower. So I'm particularly excited to share it with all of you. So one thing I want to make abundantly clear before we begin this conversation, and that is that, and that is that reframing is not lying to yourself or to others. It is not trying to convince yourself of things that you know in your heart aren't true. As a psychologist, those are not strategies that I can get behind. So what reframing is, is about recognizing that your current perspective on a situation is not the only one. Your interpretation of events is not the only interpretation. It's recognizing that there are always other ways of seeing, understanding, and interpreting events, and many of them may be equally valid. And some of them might be a lot more helpful, a lot more practically useful than the ways you're seeing things now. It's recognizing that we're not God. No matter how smart or educated or experienced we are, there are always things we don't know, parts of the puzzle that we don't yet see. And our job isn't to, to be desperately attached to our current perspective on a situation. It's to expand our understanding as much as possible so that we can then choose the perspective that serves us best. So let me give you a really simple example of what reframing looks like in action. So true story from the first day uh, that I was working on developing the narrative for this part of the session. So I love coffee. And one of the machines I have here at home is a Keurig, right? We know what those are, right? They're the, the pods that have the little, um, the machines that have the little pod that make a single cup of coffee. You see them in hotel rooms and a lot of other places a lot of the time. They're a great idea but not super environmentally friendly with all the single use pods that you then just throw out. So it turns out you can actually get reusable pods and fill them with the ground coffee of your choice. So as I was using the little plastic scoop to fill them um, with, uh, with coffee that particular day, I apparently pressed a little bit too hard and I snapped off the handle from a scoop and showered ground coffee uh, everywhere. My first reaction was a set of angry words that I will not share with you here, but which you can probably imagine. Uh, I was pissed and frustrated, but almost immediately I had a second reaction, which was, you know what? That stupid little plastic scoop was too wide for the pods anyway. It always spilled coffee as I was packing the pods, no matter how careful I was. You know what? Heck, it's probably just as well. I've got a little metal scoop that's smaller and that's probably gonna work better anyway. Boom, reframe. And instantly, my anger and frustration were gone. Now, did that reframe magically unbreak the plastic scoop, put it back together as if nothing had ever happened? Of course not. But it diffused a lot of useless emotions that weren't gonna make the situation any better. And it allowed me to move forward in a much more useful fashion. That is the power of reframing. It doesn't deny what happened. It just gives you alternative ways of thinking about and relating to a situation that are equally true and that can serve you better. So I want to give us kind of a fun way to play around with and practice this right now in a totally non-scary, non-threatening kind of way. So I want you to take a look at this image and write down somewhere for yourself your answer to this question. What is this drawing about? So imagine you walked into an art gallery and you saw this drawing on the wall. What would the little explanatory sign next to the drawing say? What would be the little paragraph explaining the story that the artist was trying to tell with this drawing? So take a minute or so and go ahead and write those uh, things out somewhere. What is this drawing about? And what's the story that's being told here? For the record, there's no not right or wrong answer. This is not hanging in a gallery with some actual answer. So whatever your interpretation is, is awesome. Okay, take a minute, think about that and go ahead and write that down somewhere. Okay, 
If you're still writing, totally awesome. What I want to do now is give us a chance to see all the different stories that we're all seeing in this drawing. Now, I know this is a bold move. We've got 152 um, of, on, of us on the call right now. But what I'd like you to do is actually go ahead and open up the Q&A box. That should be part of the, uh, you know, the, the toolkit or the tool uh, box line that you've got there. Go ahead and open up the Q&A box and actually type your answer into that box. So what is the story that you're seeing here? Just start typing that in. And once you've submitted yours, go ahead and take a look at all of the other answers that folks are typing in. And let's just see how much diversity we get in our interpretations of this drawing. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here and I'm gonna open up the Q&A box myself. I can't type anything in, um, but let's take a look and see what people are typing in. Okay, so let's see. Confusion, emotions, people looking for each other Monday morning. Oh, I'm loving that answer. Um, social ex anxiety experienced by men, different types of people, emotions, Ooh, blank emotion. Um, there are many people in this world with too much stress and confusion. Kathy, I totally get that on that one. Um, people, are <laughs> people are waiting for their train at Grand Central Station in New York. Awesome. We're all different, but live in the same world. People in a crowd yet feeling alone. Oof like deep thoughts, Allison, I'm liking that one. Um, a crowded bar scene, Monday morning, starting to see a theme there. Um, election day, hey, very timely answer as well. Um, dozens of accused eyes and trying to run from it. Ooh, fascinating. Um, negative reactions, people, diversity of the population, busy city, city people just exiting. Let's see, faces and experiences, caught off guard, chaos. Ooh, Oh, Dominic, I'm liking yours. The masks I wear based on how I feel. So many different ones, and sometimes I add them together. Listenings, um, emotions, everyday life, lots of faces, most not happy. Um, ooh, one woman's view of the men around her. Isolation in a crowded world. Um, people are alone, confused, fearful, mistrusting of each other, perspective. Um, let's see, the journey of life, ah, crowded city rush hour, the many faces of New York City. We, we have a few folks from New York here totally getting that. Um, all people have different talents, gifts, likes and dislikes. Uh, people, people everywhere, not the thought to see. Oh, I like the literacy of that one. Very cool. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought it was all the scientists who worked at Los Alamos. I'm sort of loving that and I actually really wanna know the story behind that one. Um, zombies escaping judgment. Ooh, each one is worried about something unique to them. Okay, fascinating experiment. Um, if you've got answers you haven't typed in, keep typing them. I'm, I'm gonna close my chat box just so I'm not distracted because I wanna get back to what I wanna share with you guys here. So thank you all for doing this. So what you've all just done as a group, generate a wide variety of equally true interpretations of the same data is exactly what reframing is. And part of the beauty of reframing is that it doesn't even require other people. Once you get the hang of it, you can do it all on your own as well. So let's think about how we might apply reframing to difficult conversations. One thing we might do is reframe our blame of the other person. Once we better understand why that person feels the way they do, why they made the choices they made, what their actual intentions were, along with our own in, uh, contributions to the situation, we may be less focused on blame and retribution and more able to focus on how to repair the damage and prevent a recurrence in the future. And maybe our frame allows us to shift from thinking uh, that person is insens an insensitive jerk to, you know what, they felt unjustly accused based on assumptions I was making and responded in a way that was defensive but also kind of understandable. So whenever you find yourself in a difficult conversation, I encourage you to expand your thinking and try to generate as many viable alternative perspectives as you possibly can. Now, again, they have to be viable alternative perspectives, things that are likely as reasonable, uh, things are as true, at least as possible as your original perspective. So your job isn't to BS yourself, it's to expand your perspective and identify the alternative perspectives that already exist, but that you're just not seeing yet. Then once you've done so, choose the most helpful or the most benevolent of those perspectives and move forward from there. So what I'd like you to do now is to think about anything you could possibly reframe 
in the difficult conversation that you've been working with. So what could you potentially think about differently? Is it something about the other person's intentions, emotions, or behaviors? Is it something about your own actions or intentions or assumptions? Is it maybe even your belief about what the conversation was about at its core? Uh, maybe you thought it was about a specific issue that you disagreed on, but maybe now you wonder if what it was really about was all the unspoken emotions that you each were feeling, but not sharing. So take a minute or two and write down a couple of different ways that you could potentially see some part of that conversation or the situation that conversation was about differently now. Okay, so as we get towards the end of our conversation today, I want to pause here and reflect on everything that we've covered in the session and also talk about where do you go from here? So what's your next move? So our goal was to figure out how to make hard things, specifically difficult conversations, easier. And to do that, we broke the session into two main parts. In the first part of the session, we developed a deeper understanding of why we get ourselves into trouble with conversations in the first place. So the five derailers, which are emotions, assumptions, different stories, persuasion, and blame. Then in the second part of our conversation, we turned our attention to alternative approaches that can serve us better. So a series of tactics and techniques that can help get difficult conversations back on track or even better, prevent them from derailing in the first place. And throughout the session, I ask you to think about how all of this applied to the difficult conversation that you chose to work on yourself at the beginning of the session. So on this slide, I invite you to answer one final question. And that is, what is one thing you want to experiment with in your next difficult conversation? So think about everything we've covered today, the various different things you identified as potentially some challenges for you, some opportunities for you. And just think about if you just want to try one experiment in your next difficult conversation, what would that be? And go ahead and write that down for yourself. Okay, so generally speaking, I don't like to include a lot of text on my slides, but I did want to share a very powerful perspective with you from the Harvard Negotiation Project team behind the difficult conversations research, because I think they do a brilliant job of explaining why it's so critically important for us to master this skill set as leaders of our organizations. So I'm going to put this up here, let you read it on your own, and then I just want to add a couple of additional perspectives of my own on the other side. So take a minute. Take a read through there. So this is why we care about difficult conversations as leaders, because the adaptability and therefore the survival and success of our businesses depends upon it. And that is hugely important. But it's not just our businesses that depend on our skill set in this area. It's critical to the health and vibrancy of our, most, of our most cherished personal relationships as well. And I think that is equally important. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the session here today, my goal is always to share content with you that helps you do two things, succeed more and suffer less. And the insights and tools we discussed today are really beautifully positioned to help you do precisely that in all parts of life. 
So I thank you so much for taking the time to join with me today. And I really look forward to hearing the stories of how you're putting this all into practice. Um, with that, I will say thank you and hand it over to Anne to open it up for some Q&A for us here. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Eve. I think many of us grew up professionally in an environment where emotions were unprofessional. So both transferring emotions and stuffing them down resonate really well with me. Um, so we had a question, how can someone foster this kind of thinking with their teams? This was all great for us today. How do they infuse some of these practices down into their teams? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's that's the end game, right? It's like great for you to learn it, but you got to bring everybody else along in this journey. So one thing, of course, is, you know, share this with the folks on your team. That would be the first port of call. Um, so, I mean, that would be my first thing. So sit, have that conversation, watch the video and talk about, okay, how do we see this playing out in the organization? Where do we feel our own challenges are? And being willing to lead from the front and be vulnerable about, about, vulnerable about where you see your own challenges in that space. And then, you know, well, a couple other things that we think of. One is, you really have to lead from the front on this. So I would encourage everybody who's on the call here today to really think about what's that one thing you wrote down in the final question on, that I asked you, one thing you wanna to try to experiment with and just start behaving in different ways and see the different reactions that you get. Sometimes you don't even have to tell people about it. You can just role model those behaviors. They see you behaving in different ways and they get different reactions when they come to you with um, you know, difficult conversations and that's a place to begin. Um, I do also think that the difficult conversations book, I've got mine here. You can see there's just a few notes um, in there is a great resource. So that would be the next thing to get probably and share with your teams um, if you wanna do that as well. And I think when we send out the resources after, we'll make sure that there's a link to that book too. Excellent. Yeah, I, would, I wanted to ask you to reconfirm Alice of the Heart, one of my favorites. <laughs> We're both Brene Brown fans. And yep. then um, Difficult Conversations. I know there's a lot of books about conversations. Yes, conversations. this is the one. Uh, difficult yeah, Conversations. Okay, so excellent. That's a great resource for us to know um, and appreciate that you're vetting all of those, those things for us. Um, in Emotional Integrity, can you just reconfirm those three steps? Um, to use to respond to in, in a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So again, you guys will get a couple of these slides after so you'll be able to see those too. So it's share, acknowledge, and avoid evaluation. So again, share is all about, do I actually know the emotions I'm experiencing? And the same for the other person. And are we uh, sharing with those each other, with each other in ways that are both honest and appropriate, right? Um, right. Uh, acknowledge is, I heard what you said, uh, I care about how you feel, and I'm trying to understand why you feel the way you feel. And then again, the last one uh, is avoid evaluation. So avoid the temptation to feel like that person's feelings are totally unjustified and try to call them on it because then we just get defensive. So again, your job is just to share your own feelings, listen to theirs, um, acknowledge again, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I care about what you feel. I'm trying to understand why you feel the way you feel and the, reserve the judgment about honestly your own feelings because you feel how you feel and other person's uh, emotions as well. Are there best practices for acknowledging like Mad Libs for difficult conversations? <laughs> I feel this about that. You know, can't <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I, I feel like the language here can be a very individual thing. So as long as you're saying, I hear what you're saying, I care about how you feel, and I'm working to try to understand how I feel that way. Like whatever language feels natural to you, and it's probably not gonna feel super natural if this is not a practice you've engaged in before. So feel free to like play around with some wording in advance because you don't wanna to try to make it up in the moment because you're probably also you know super hyped up then. So a little bit of prep here before you're in a difficult conversation is worth the investment. Yeah, I've been working on this personally, and it's amazing how much just emotion is released when you say, I feel X about Y. Just getting that out there is, is such a big first step. Yeah, yeah. All right, we have a, a long question. So okay. uh, next, <laughs> um, definitely it's something that we appreciate. And um, this is from someone to protect others with their difficult emotions. So here's an example. A friend asked for a re uh, reaction to her performance review, review, and it was difficult to be honest with her about her biggest blind spots, which could be useful for her to address. So this person asked what kind of feedback she was looking for, and then left the conversation assuming she's not ready to address the patterns of behavior that keep her stuck. So like with that, with withholding something was useful because it would make her uncomfortable. 
So much going on in that conversation. Um, so what I'm going to suggest here, um, particularly if you've got an ongoing relationship, personal, professional with somebody, is actually something that I talk about in my original mindset sessions. I'm going to reach back a little bit and pull a technique that I talk about uh, in there. So one of the things I talk about um, in the mindset sessions when we talk about feedback, because that's a whole section um, in the mindset session, is uh, giving people feedback in a way that they can hear because we do not all have the same preferences when it comes to how we like to receive feedback. The things, whoop, a little bug, how annoying. Um, the things that we respond well or poorly to when we're on the receiving end of feedback. So I think one of the things that might be worth considering, again, particularly if this is somebody you have an ongoing relationship with, is before you have any feedback for them or sort of outside of that, go to them and say, hey, how can I share feedback with you, particularly the tough stuff in a way that you can hear? And, you know, like, What's a good, what's good timing? How much of a heads up do you want? How much detail do you want? What percentage of uh, praise versus criticism do you prefer? All kind of their preferences, get a handle on that stuff. And then when the time comes to give them feedback, you've got a sense of how you can deliver it in a way that they're able to hear. But if you don't ever ask them what their preferences are, or if you just assume that their preferences are the same as yours, which is rarely the case, um, you're kind of guessing and not, not the best strategy. So that might be, again, something to think about um, outside of the specific feedback conversation. Find out that information. And then when the time comes, you're much better positioned to do it in a way that's likely to go well. Yeah. So I guess the choice, Darren, sorry, is uh, you did the right thing <laughs> by asking what kind of feedback, um, yeah. which is very helpful. But yeah, sometimes people just want to want to vent. And sometimes mm -hmm. um, they actually want constructive feedback. I think about the video of the, the woman with the nail, <laughs> the nail. on her forehead. That's my favorite. It's not about the nail. Yeah, but it is sometimes. Yeah, in the end, <laughs> it must be really hard. I think about those as acknowledging statements like, you know, that must be very hard for you. Um, or, you know, I can't, I understand. I think I had a, an HR director who was great with a lot of this kind of things. And I think about, you know, things are symptomatic, right? Like whatever you're addressing is really symptomatic of the, the bigger problem. And I think that's what you talked about is the truth versus what is actually important. So getting to uh, what is important. Yep. Okay. Um, so when is venting healthy and when is it not? And just making things worse. Ooh, boy, this is where like, I wish I had a follow-up question. So it kind of depends on what we mean by venting. So, you know, kind of in the situation we just talked about, if you've got somebody who just had a really crappy day at work and they want to come home and just vent to their significant other, just like, oh, I just need to get this off my chest and I don't need you to solve anything. I just need to get it out. Like, hey, you know, time and a place for that. You don't even need another person for that. Like you can talk to you know, my little gahunka back here. You just, you know, talk to some inanimate object. That's totally fine. Um, now, venting in the context of a difficult conversation, which is I need to have a conversation with you and I'm feeling very intensely emotional about something, that's where we want to avoid the venting. So um, that's a place where, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that most of us fall into one of two categories when it comes to emotions. We either shut them down, pretend we don't have them, um, at least on the outside, or we overdo it and we let the other person have it. So if that's the kind of venting we're talking about, we just let the other person have it and it's directed at that person, not a good strategy for this. But again, if it's just coming home after a crappy day and venting to somebody else and saying, hey, I don't need you to fix anything. I just need to get off my chest. I'm okay with that strategy. Right. It's because sometimes, I mean, I think Darren, you know, what kind of feedback do you want? I just want to be able to transfer my emotions to you. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to offload them somewhere else because you don't right, need them right. either. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and I want to come back to something you were talking about earlier, because, you know, I do think it is helpful. Um, and you can do this on both sides of the conversation. So, you know, if you come back and you just had that really terrible day at work, you know, give your significant other a heads up. You're like, I'm just pissed about this. I don't need you to fix it, but can you just listen to me? Cause I want to get off my chest. Like that relieves the person of having to do anything about it. So if you have the wherewithal to recognize what that's what you need, saying that on the front end is helpful. If the other person doesn't have the wherewithal to say that, and you're the one who's receiving it, you're absolutely um, within your rights to say at the end of that, do you want me just to say they're there or, or you know, like war game it with you, you know, just so again, you can do it as the person offloading it if you've got the wherewithal to do it. But again, if that's not the case and you're on the receiving end, totally legit to say, what is it you need from me? Do you want problem solving or do you just want to get it off your chest? Either yeah. way is fine. 
Well, I'm wondering, I mean, I love the idea about reframing and that's such an important skill, I think. And, you know, is there a way of coming back at it again to be able to say, I've been thinking about what you shared with me. And if you're open to some just some suggestions now, maybe when the emotions aren't running as high, maybe that it could be a way to help someone reframe what their, their emotions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, when emotions are running super hot to your point, it's really hard for the person to hear that. They're just, they feel how they feel. It's very intense. We tend to have laser focus on our interpretation of the problem. It's hard to even, you know, let alone recognize the stuff, but even be open to it. So you're totally legit saying something like, you know what, I have some additional thoughts on this. I recognize now is not the time, but if at some point later that would be interesting, let me know. Happy to share. So they don't even have to say yes in the moment, but like give some time once they cool off to come back when they feel they can hear it. And that's great. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that they talk about in difficult conversations is that difficult conversations are rarely a single conversation. They're usually a series of conversations that happen over time. And I think that also kind of takes the pressure off. If we're dealing with something that's pretty intense and emotional and serious, we don't have to you know, sign, seal, delivered the entire thing in the one conversation, that may not be realistic or the best strategy. So recognizing that we can do this over time is also okay. And that that's probably how this is going to go. Yeah, that was exactly my difficult situation. Uh, my friend and I came back and talked about it after the fact, and she shared, right, the different paths of, well, you were thinking this, but this is actually what I was thinking. And it's, you know, understanding both perspectives that didn't happen in one conversation. So Absolutely. I think that's, that's the other thing is that if the conversation inspires emotion in you is to know, hey, let's put a pin in this and come back um, mm -hmm. when, it's, when it's a little bit more, um, we can address this on a different level. Mm -hmm. For sure. Okay, my very last question is, how do you think the virtual environment makes it harder or easier to have these conversations or to, to go through these steps? Oh, man, we saved the biggest question for the last one there, <laughs> didn't we? All right, it's going to end with a bang here. Wow. Okay, so I mean, a couple of different thoughts. I mean, one is most of us have been doing this for two and a half years now, so we're not rookies at this anymore. Um, hopefully, we've got a reasonable you know, degree of self-awareness about how we show up on Zoom and various other platforms. And we've got a better sense of how to read other people's emotions in Zoom. You know, the truth of the matter is, is that you do lose something um, in a virtual environment that you can't pick up. Zoom is a lot better than just pick up the phone. So my first suggestion is, you know, if you're going to have a difficult conversation, do it in person if you can, right? Because yeah. that is likely to go better. You know, next best choice is probably Zoom, because you can at least get some of that, you know, beyond that, we get into things that we don't really want to do. So just a telephone call, absolutely not email, absolutely not text. Um, but yeah, I think the the skill sets that we talked about here in the session today don't require you to actually be physically located in the same place. Every single one of them is something that you can do. I mean, you could do it um, on the phone, but you absolutely can do that uh, on Zoom. So I think, yeah, you know, as a psychologist, do we lose a little bit of the nonverbal signals? We do, um, mm -hmm. but we get a lot of those things and there's absolutely nothing we talked about here today that we couldn't do equally as well in a virtual environment. And the truth of the matter is, that's the reality for most of us moving forward. So somehow we're going to have to figure this out. It's the yeah. exact same set of strategies. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eve. Um, I always enjoy our conversations and your insights. This new content's fantastic. A lot of takeaways. I am sure our attendees will appreciate. We will be sending a link to today's recording and slides within 24 hours. So you have all of those steps that Eve shared as well. So thank you, Eve. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yes. All right. So be sure for our members to join us next Friday for an exclusive conversation. Rod, Ron Ishog from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, he's going to come to Vistage in a live member exclusive discussion about the impact of the midterm elections for small and mid-sized businesses. That's a week from now on Friday, November 18th. You can register for this session now on my Vistage. And that is exclusive for our Vistage members. Also plan to join us for our next virtual national CEO conference on business growth. That is December 9th featuring our keynote speakers, Shark Tanks, Barbara Corcoran and innovation expert, Martin Lindstrom. Looking forward to that. So mark your calendar for December 9th and be sure to register to hold that spot on your calendar. 
More information on that is available at vistage.com slash growth 2022. That's vistage.com slash growth 2022. Thank you so much for your time today, everyone. Have a great day. Be safe and be well.